Hello and welcome again to Mountain Valley Fellowship here in the winter wonderland of Hagen, Montana. I'm Alan Dameron, pastor, and uh, I'm glad uh, you decided to join us today. Now, uh, obviously this is the Christian, excuse me, the Christmas season. Uh, it's also the Christian season, by the way, uh, here in Mountain Valley Fellowship, and we absolutely enjoy, celebrate, celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we announce here at Mountain Valley Fellowship without any reservation whatsoever that uh, this is a season uh, to shout, to proclaim, to live. Uh, the fact that Jesus Christ came, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the grave. I mean, I'm just telling you, we here at Mountain Valley are all about Jesus, and that certainly applies to his birth. We, we like to repeat what the prophet of old Isaiah said uh, in Isaiah 7, 14. He says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, here's the sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then in chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah continues, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, rather, uh, he continues by saying, For unto us a child is born, not just any child, but the Christ child was born unto us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And uh, I'm just telling you, just based on those two verses, uh, uh, it, you can understand the reason for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We've received Christ as our Lord and our Savior. You can understand why the celebration, the party is absolutely at, at peak level. So with that in mind here, we want you to know that we proudly, proudly proclaim to you that Jesus is the one and only reason for the season. Today we're going to talk about this Christmas, the Christmas story. And we're glad that you're here to do that. Welcome to Mountain Valley Fellowship in Hagen, Montana, where we're bringing God's message to the valley. Welcome today as we uh, return to God's Word and God's message for, uh, for us. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this yet today or not. It is the atmosphere, the season. Uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, we say it all the time. We enjoy saying it because we just believe it's a time of celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, um, there are a lot of things that pour into the Christmas season, among which uh, stories, uh, movies of Christmas. Now, I'm going to date myself here a little bit. I know some of you still think I might be like eh, 29, 30, 32, a little older than that. But we grew up in our household... Uh, we watched White Christmas, you know, Bing and all that. Uh, a Charlie Brown Christmas, A Christmas Story, Ralphie and his Red Rider BB gun. I do own a Red Rider, thank you. For... Oh, and by the way, he did not, he did not shoot his eye out. Uh, you know, and, and speed it up a little bit from the past, that, that all-famous Christmas movie, Die Hard. Uh, okay, all right, for some people. Uh, the Miracle on 34th Street, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, the... You know, thank, thank the Lord he, say, he was saved. Uh, Christmas Vacation, and then, of course, Home Alone. I mean, just the list is almost endless, and everybody has a different favorite, but they all point to some aspect uh, of the Christmas season. Now, uh, without debating the pros and cons of the Hollywood-produced movie about Christmas, let's, let's segue from there to the understanding that there is really, I mean, come on, seriously, really only one story, the story of Christmas. And it's the story we find in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. 1 through 20. Now, all of those other stories, all of these other movies, all of these other productions pale by comparison when we arrive at the Christmas story, the story that records the early first hours, the miracle message from God that God so loved us that he sent his son. I want us to do something uh, a little bit different. I want us to go back to Luke, and uh, let's just take a moment to read. Luke chapter 2, it's uh, after Mark Allen, thank you very much. Luke chapter 2, and I just want us to read through this story. In fact, let me encourage you, Christmas Day, uh, 
Christmas Eve. Always, always plan around sometime on, on Christmas the reading of this story to your family because uh, it's a great story. It is the great story. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. We know something about taxing. In verse 2, And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of, the, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was, of course, of the house and lineage of David. That's, that's how they did it. Verse 5 then, So he went up with Mary to be taxed with his espoused wife, being great with child. And it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Isn't it, ama isn't it amazing to realize that the King of Kings, the Lord God Himself, was not born in a palatial palace somewhere, but a manger, a smelly, lowly manger. And verse 8, that's a message all of its own, by the way. Verse 8 says, And they were in the same country, shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. While Mary was bringing forth the Christ child, these shepherds were out taking care of sheep. And in verse 9 it says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Right, you think? I can, I can just hear one of the shepherds going home. His wife asks, well, honey, I was work tonight. Come on, just give me a sentence. Uh, yeah, hey, let, I'm just going to be honest with you. If an angel shows up to talk to me, I'm going to be sore afraid, right? I'm, yeah, uh, you'll have to wake me up. Verse 10, and here's what the angel said. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The gospel message is for all people. Christ came to offer salvation to every person, not just a select group, which, by the way, now is going to be a, a large step from God's people just being the Jewish people. And now with the coming of Christ and the gospel, the new covenant, the New Testament, Christ is going to offer eternal life to everyone who would receive it. Uh, well, whether we receive it or not, by the way. So... Uh, for unto you, uh, verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign un unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. In a manger. Christ was lying in a manger. Mercy. Verse 18, and suddenly there was with the angel multitudes of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Oh, you know, if the angel, not bad enough, he's got a few, uh, the choir showed up. So, um, and here's what they said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Verse 15, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, I can't, I'm, man. Let, no, here's what they said, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Hmm. And they, and they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Verse 17, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. What a great message, message within a message. These shepherds, all they could do but go and tell what they've seen and what they've heard. It's, that's kind of almost like witnessing. Just, just share what, what's happened in your life. So, uh, verse 18, And all that heard it wondered at those things which they were told by them of the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard, seen as it was told unto them. Well, you know, that's the Christmas story. And again, man, make sure you read it a number of times at this time of the year. Um, hey, maybe not just at this time of the year. But I got to thinking, you know, this is the Christmas story. Is there, is there another way to share the Christmas story? Uh, maybe, maybe in less verses. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I think there is. Uh, and so for the next few moments, I want, I want to just walk through a passage of Scripture that may or may not be familiar to you, but it is in, in essence, in a nutshell, in, 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 a, in a, a perfectly wrapped gift itself, uh, it, it is the Christmas story, the Christmas story. And to find that Christmas story, we're going to turn to the Gospel of, of John. John 
3.16. Mm -hmm. John 3.16, of course, some people have said, uh, and maybe so, that this is the heart of the entire Bible, this one verse. Uh, uh, you could really make a case for it. John 3.16. And, and not only it is, it could be called the verse of the entire Bible, I believe it's also a verse that can, that, that can be used uh, uh, to relay the Christmas story. And, and there's two or three things I want us to, to look at in reference to that. But first, I want us to pray together, okay? Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name uh, because we can. Because there was a moment, a place, and a time when, when I, I bowed my head and my heart and I understood that I, I was a sinner separated from God and I accepted what Christ did on the cross for me and uh, I received Him as my personal Lord and Savior. And so, Father, I, 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 I don't ever want to get over the miraculous miracle of just being able to pray to you, to talk to you and know that you hear. Now, Father, thank you for the Christmas story. Without it, we, we, we would be without hope. But today we just, uh, we, we ask Holy Spirit that you take us to this verse, that you'd open our minds, open our hearts. Father, I pray right now, if there's somebody watching, listening, I pray right now, if there's never been a time in their life when they ask you and to become their Lord and their Savior. They've never received and understood the Christmas story. I pray that today, that the day, that'll be that day. And not only will they be able to read it, they'll be able to know the Christmas story deep within their hearts because they've received you as their Lord and their Savior. Now, Father, teach us. So make us teachable, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. So this one little verse, I believe there are four components, if you will, to the Christmas story as told in John Chapter 3, verse 16. First of all, I believe that the first compo component we're going to come across in this Christmas story is the component that the fact that this Christmas story in John 3, 16 is a story about love. It's a story of love. That's how the verse starts. John 3, 16, the very first part says, For God so loved the world. Man, what a great way to start a story, right? For God so loved the world, the Christmas story, if it's anything... It's about God's love. Now, there are two or three things here. If you want to know how much God loves you, and, and, and it may have been a while since somebody has just told you personally, I want you to know something. God loves you. God loves you. Whether you accept it, understand it, know it or not, He still loves you. If you want to know how much God loves you, all you've got to do is take one quick glimpse back to, the, to, to that manger that, that morning, that night. Because therein is the living proof that God loves you. That tiny baby Jesus, born in a lonely manger in the midst of cows and all that stuff that goes with it. So, it says here that, that God not only loved the world, that He so loved the world. Uh, it, it's a very clear indication that God didn't just love the world and, oh, by the way, oh, you know, I hope everybody's happy. No, He so loved the world... in. in which, which kind of lends us to understand that he loved the world enough to meet the needs of the world. He so loved it. He so loved it so that he could meet the need. What was the greatest need of mankind? It still is. It's to know him personally, to be forgiven of sin, to have a relationship with him. N knowing God is not a religion. Religion is simply man's fetal attempt to try to reach up to holy God and can never get it done. It's a personal relationship. And in the birth of this Christ child on that day, God expressed to us His love. He didn't just say it. He proved it. He did it. And we have here in that manger expression of God's love. And, and the love was so, so, so wonderful, so miraculous that it, that it completely would provide everything that we would need in Christ Jesus. Uh, his gift of love uh, may or may not have been what... Uh, some, most of the world wanted, but I'm telling you what, his gift of love in the, in the birth of the Christ child is the gift that the world needed and needs. I mean, you get all your lists out, what do you want for Christmas? I want this, I want that. I'm telling you, it may not be on your want list, but I'm telling you absolutely it is at the very top of your need list. You need to know Christ personally in your life. There's no, other great, there's no greater need than that because it affects not only here, it affects forever. And ever and ever and ever. Now, this gift is so perfect. It's perfect in size. Uh, per, it's a perfect in color. It won't break. Batteries won't run down. You don't have to return. How many of y'all? Uh, how many of y'all did the trying to figure out what was in the gift deal? Right? You go over there and now. Uh, 
I don't think we're all that different. We had a tendency as, as it grew closer to Christmas Day. Oh, by the way, no gifts open until Christmas morning. Thank you very much. Um, but but we, we, we kind of, we, we would put all of our gifts in one spot. Mine are over here. Gail's over here. Ladon's over here. <coughs> Excuse me, my two older sisters. Mom didn't like that. And she was always rearranging. And because uh, we've got, well, you've got six, I've got five. Yeah, they don't love me. I mean, anyway, uh, uh, but I'm just telling you, uh, this gift of, of Christ's uh, birth on that night is the gift. The gift of all gifts. Why? Because of all the little gifts you're going to get, underwear, socks, baseball men, a doll, a wagon, whatever. All, guess what? All of those are wonderful presents. But this gift, the gift of God, the fact that He so loved the world is the gift that keeps on giving and on giving. It's an eternal gift because it's a life-changing gift. So, um, you know, man has done, a, like a lot of words, we've, we've really done a number on this word love. Um, uh, 1 John, uh, let, let's, let's go over here to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I, I want us to... Uh, Look up the fact, uh, fact of, 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 the, of the presentation of God's love in His Word. 1 John chapter 4, uh, uh, two verses. 1 John 4, uh, verses... <coughs> excuse me. Somehow I'm uh, coughing for some reason. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says in verse 8, He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because God, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Whew, what great verse. Those are two Christmas verses, I'm just telling you. You, you see, what the world doesn't understand, we, we've just so twisted that word love to make it fit our own purposes. But I'm just telling you, according to the Word of God now, it tells us explicitly, clearly, God is love. He not only loves, right, as an action, he is love. There is no other, no other source, resource that, that is love. God is. And then he says, this love uh, came, came in the form of an action. Uh, it says it was manifested. That means we can see it. Uh, this love toward, toward us. It was not just an action. He was just not throwing a dart and trying to... I mean, I'm just telling you, when God said he loved us, he loved you... He meant that exactly. He loves you so much, as it says in this verse, that He sent His only begotten Son into the world. Why? Why would He do that? Why would love's demand call for Christ coming to this earth? Because God knew, Jesus knew, that only through His sacrificial love, His gift of love, uh, that the needs of mankind, your need, my need, for forgiveness, um, uh, the gift of eternal life, a relationship with God, that's the only way it's going to be, it was only possible. Only through Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what, get this down. There's no other way, no other person, no other system, no other power whereby you can, you can become related to God the Heavenly Father and that, that, that is but through Jesus Christ. Jesus said himself, I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So... If, if, if the Christmas story is anything, the first part of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. In all of its sin, in all of its... Ugh, Colossians, let's just come back a couple of pages. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Colossians 1. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Let me start there. Verse 19 says, For if it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things on, in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind with wicked works, yet now have been reconciled, how? Verse 22, if you, excuse me, in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blamable and unreprovable in His sight. Uh, Lord, Lord, thank You for this Christmas story and the beginning of it. For God so loved the world. Let me repeat it one more time. I want you to understand clearly. God loves you. God loves you. 
And that's the, that's the beginning part of this Christmas story. Let's go to the second part. Back to John chapter 3, 16. This Christmas story, the Christmas story, is also a story about sacrifice. It's also a story about sacrifice. God's sacrifice. Now, like the word love, let's go ahead and, head and, and head admit it. Um, we've done a number on sacrifice. Um, uh, we don't understand what that means. But So let, let's go back, go back with me just for a moment. Let's do a little homework here um, and, and, and see if we can understand what it means in the Christmas story. Uh, the, the, the group called Got Questions on the Internet. It, excellent. Excellent. I, I've read, of course, haven't read everything they've done, but uh, they remind us of several points about this business of sacrifice. First of all, right out of the box, they say, now listen, from the very beginning, all through Scripture, God wants you to know that He hates human sacrifice. That's, that's never, never been a desire. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 12, 31, and chapter 18, verse 10. 12, 31, 18, 10. Look those up later. It's a reference to that, that situation. Uh, secondly, they, they uh, report, uh, there is uh, no doubt that a sacrifice for sin was and is necessary if people are to have any hope of eternal life. God established the necessity of the shedding of blood to cover sin. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You, you know, some years ago, uh, some group was trying to take the word, the, the word blood out of the Bible. I'm just telling you, you take the word blood out of the word of God, the Bible, there is no, there is no salvation because it was through his shed blood that, that, that we, we can know salvation. We can have salvation. So, so this sacrifice was not just uh, you know, something man-made, but uh, uh, divinely inspired and, and, and called for. Uh, they also add that God, uh, uh, God Himself performed the very first animal sacrifice to cover temporarily the sin of Adam and Eve. You remember way back in the Garden of Eden, chapter 3, uh, Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, the fruit that God said, listen, you, everything's yours, Adam and Eve, except for this one fruit. Don't eat of it because if you do, the day you do it, you, sh you shall die. Well, they ate of it. They died. They died. Eventually, they died physically. They died spiritually immediately, and they died, they died eternally in, uh, uh, apart from God's grace. So, so, so what did God do? He, he's in the process of kicking them out of the garden where the tree of life is so that they don't take of it and live forever in their sin. He took an animal, the scripture tells us, slew that innocent animal, made coats of, of, of clothing to cover their nakedness, and it's a perfect snapshot picture uh, of what Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. We couldn't cover ourselves. We were sinful before God. We were naked in our sin and our will willful rebellion against God. And so God had to, had to, through a sacrifice of an innocent animal, through an innocent Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood has to cover us in order for us to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. Hmm, mercy. The innocent... For the guilty. That's, that's really a, a really pretty good definition of sacrifice in this context. Now, we know that when God gave the law of Moses to the Moses, there were extensive instructions on how and when and under what circumstances to have animal sacrifices. And this continued all through the Old Testament. They offered a sacrifice to cover the... I mean, it was a daily thing. I mean, it was specific. You want to know how specific? Go, go back over to Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and you'll find out. Now... All of these temporary sacrifices, these animal sacrifices were done and needed up until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, those sacrifices never did completely take away the sins of the people, right? That, this sacrificial system in the Old Testament was to continue until Christ came, as they say, to offer the ultimate perfect sacrifice which made animal sacrifices no longer necessary. Let me, read, let me read for us Hebrews 10, 3 and 4. But those sacrifices, the animals, are of an annual uh, uh, reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Oh boy. You know, man is really good at trying to conjure up, create a system, an answer to take care of his sin problem. One of the things we've done is we've relay, re renamed sin. It's no longer sin. It's a disease. It's a, it's a flaw. It's a bad habit. I'm on and on and on. No, the Bible calls sin, sin. It's missing God's holy mark. 
We miss the mark of God's holiness. And we can never hit it because we are sinful. We're not only sinners but who commit sins. I mean, we're separated from God's holiness. Um, so, uh, got questions add here. Uh, it continues by saying that the only visible sacrifice must be an infinite one, which means only God Himself could atone for the sins of mankind. Only God Himself, an infinite holy being, sinless, could pay the penalty owed to Himself. That is why God had to become man and dwell among men, John 1, 14. Let's go look, let's look at that. John chapter 1, verse 14. What a great verse. John, the Gospel of John writes, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh. Capital W there, the Word referring to Jesus. And Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, now, uh, technically, bear with me, we're, we're about to move on. Technically, God didn't sacrifice Jesus, rather Jesus as God incarnate, uh, willingly laid down His life vicariously. He, he, it says no one forced Him. He laid down His life willingly. In fact, in John 10, 18, it says no one, Jesus is speaking here, John uh, 10, 18. John chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus is talking about His death, and this is what He says as I get to John. Chapter 10, I know you hear chapter 10. Verse 10 and verse 18 says, No man taketh it from me. He's talking about His life. Jesus is speaking. He says, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Whoa. So God the Father, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the sacrifice. You thought I forgot. No. That's the second part of this, of this Christmas story. For God so loved the world, the story is about love, that He gave His only begotten Son. It's a story about sacrifice. Sacrifice. Um... Romans 5, 8 says, In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy. John 14, 6. Let's look at that. We're, we're just in the same neighborhood. John chapter 14, verse 6. This new Bible and I, we're, uh, we're, at, we're battling it out, but I, I, I'm going to win. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, Jesus Himself declares here the significance of His sacrifice is exclusively eternal. You see, in the, in the day that Jesus was crucified, there were a whole lot of people being crucified. What, what made His crucifixion different than any other crucifixion it is because He is and was the Son of God, God Himself, all God, all man, and it was because He willingly laid down His life for a specific purpose. He willingly laid down as a sinless sacrifice. Think about that. Not completing one, not committing one sin. He fulfilled the requirement God the Father had placed upon him to be sinless. He laid down his sinless life, spilt his sinless blood, and, and in doing so gave that sacrifice to the Father to purchase for us our eternal salvation because we in our sin couldn't do that. So, this Christmas story is a Christmas story about love, for God so loved the world. It's a story about sacrifice that He gave His only begotten Son. Mercy. God's the giver, right? Number three, this Christmas story is also not only about love and about sacrifice, it's a story about faith. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. For God so loved the world, it's a story about love. That He gave His only begotten Son, it's a story about sacrifice. That whosoever believeth in Him, it's a story about faith. Faith in God. So, Jesus, Jesus was born. He lived sinlessly, not committing one sin on a, on, a, on a specific day, specific night, specific hour. He laid down His life. He was put to death. He died. And in dying, He took upon Himself the sins of all the world. You know, you know Hollywood is trying to, has, has tried to produce a... A, a, a relative, a, a clear, accurate picture of the physical 
agony that Christ went through. But I'm just telling you, as, as gruesome as that gets, um, it's really not anything in comparison to the fact that the moment Christ hung on the cross, He took your sins, my sins, the sins of all the world, He who had no sin, and He became sin for us. And at that moment, the Father could no longer look at Him. Father, why hast Thou forsaken me? Answer simple, because now Jesus had become sin. He took all of our sins, past, present, and future, upon Himself. He died, and the Bible tells us on the third day, He conquered, He defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave. He rose from the dead, rose from the grave, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. Whew! I'm just, what a story. What a Christmas story. It's a story of faith. Now, here's, here's the, the faith part. Uh, God did all of that. What are you going to do with it? You see, you really have one of two choices. You're going to accept it, you're going to believe it, or you're going to reject it. It's just that simple. Uh, First Peter. Just, just a, a, a little bit of a, of a reminder what this sacrifice, excuse me, what this faith is requiring. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. First Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold for your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as it of a lamb with, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Verse 21. Let me read that. Who by him do we do believe in the God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Now listen to me. No one, no one can force you to accept and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And, and, and you cannot rely on someone else to believe for you. Well, you don't understand, brother. Uh, my granny went to church all the time. Glad she did. Hope she didn't cause any stir. Uh, uh, you know, well, we're all, we always ra we're raised in church. All those are good things. But, but the issue is simply this. Christ in, in God has done everything that's needed possible for you and I to have eternal life. What are you going to do with it? I asked that a question a while ago. Faith. You're going to have to simply by faith receive Jesus Christ. Not only for what, who He was, who He is and who He was and what He did, but right now in your life, receive Him as your Lord and your Savior. Uh, one writer says this, These two words, we're talking about faith and believing, are critical to our salvation. It is through our believing in the shed blood of Christ for our sins that we receive eternal life. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you are saved through faith. It is, uh, it, it's uh, not of works lest any man should boast. It's by faith. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, uh, but I'm just telling you, if you're sitting there watching, and you're saying, well, prove to me. You've missed the whole point. That's exactly what God did. He proved He loved you. He proved He wants He can give you eternal life. It's in, it's in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't believe that. You're, it's totally your prerogative. You can choose to believe Him and receive Him as your Savior and go and live together with Him forever and ever and ever in a place called heaven. I mean, you're, you're saved. You're never going to be unsaved when Christ comes to your life. Or you can choose to reject this gospel message, this, this Christmas story. Your choice. But it's an eternal choice. Be careful. But as many as received Him, do them cave the power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. You'll receive Him. Believe Him. Believe in Him and receive Him. He will empower you to become His, his Son. You know, there are all kinds of illustrations, human illustrations, and they often, uh, at some point, uh, they, they, they lose steam. But, but, but I, I, you know... Uh, just a few days ago, uh, we uh, had uh, an appointment. Uh, uh, we had tickets to fly to Kampala, Uganda. My youngest daughter, Alicia, and her husband, Abdul, and my three wonderful grandbabies, uh, Sweet Pea, Sweet Peanut, and Sweet Potato. Uh, thank you. Uh, they live there. Uh, they, they run a Christian school, Terranova Academy. Look, look, look into it on, on uh, on the website, uh, and, and uh, they also uh, hold and run a, a soccer academy 
uh, some 150. They have like 220 kids in the schools uh, and the class and the grade room, uh, and then they also have 150 kids. I'm just telling you. So, so he, okay, we're go we're gonna. I haven't been to Uganda since uh, 2010. So, whew, I mean, you gotta gonna want to go. You gotta. So, so we got the tickets. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. We, we were to leave on Wednesday, 5.20 in the morning. Thank you very much. We had to be at the airport at 3. Thank you very much. Why? I have no idea. But we knew we, we were leaving from Missoula, go to the airport in Missoula, be there at 5.20, go to gate, whatever it was, and, and I forget, and, and get on the plane and put your buckle your seat on. At some point, with all the information I had, at some point I was, I was going to have to take the information I was given and act upon it. You know what's so sad is there are literally millions of people sitting in a place called hell. The Bible talks about it. There is a place called hell. For those who reject the Christmas story, reject God's gift of eternal life. And, and, and you know what's so sad? They know the Christmas story. They know all the facts that Jesus was born. He died on the cross. They know all of that. But I'm just telling you, unless you do something about it, you just know something. You just know some facts. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to, right where you are, bow your head and your heart and say, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you in my life. I know Christ died on the cross. I know he's born of a virgin. I know all of that. But I, right now, Lord, I'm going to choose as an act of my will. I want to receive you as my Lord and my Savior. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You call, he'll save you. So you see... The Christmas story, it's a Christmas story of love. For God so loved the world, it's a Christmas story of sacrifice that He gave His only begotten Son. It's a Christmas story of faith that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Wouldn't it be silly? I, I can't even think in, in any uh, uh, circumstance whatsoever, as a child or as an adult, on Christmas morning when you opened those gifts and you left a gift unopened under the tree. Nah, nah I've got, you know, I've got enough here. I don't, I don't need that one. <laughs> That'll make sense, doesn't it? <laughs> no, we're ripping those things. In fact, you've got to be real careful. I'm sure this is true at your house. You've got to be real careful when you start collecting all that trash, you don't throw away a gift. Jesus Christ is the gift of Christmas. He's, God is trying to give you a gift. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Here's a gift called eternal life. But He's not going to force you to accept it. He's not going to force you to open it. He's not going to force you to receive it into your life. But He's offering it to you. Don't leave His gift of eternal life under the, under the cross, the tree of Calvary. Because it's got your name on it. It's a story of faith. What's faith? Forsaking all, I trust Him. It's not Jesus plus this and Jesus plus that. No, there's only one Savior. There's only one person who can give you eternal life, and that's Jesus Christ. What a story. What a Christmas story. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life. And that's the fourth component of our Christmas story. It's a story, lastly, of hope. Story of love, sacrifice, faith. It is the, the story about hope. Hope in God. Boy, I tell you what, if there's ever, there's ever a earmark of, um, of our world today, and I, you know, I'm sure there are other days, other eras of time that this is true, but boy, it just seems like our words just full of hopeless people with no hope. Just, just everywhere you look, given up, no hope. Well, I, I, want you to make, I want you to understand clearly, I'm not talking to you in this Christmas story about hope and hope. Well, you know, uh, I'm talking about the source of hope. I'm talking about who do you put your hope in, the focus of your hope. Uh, you see, if the focus of your hope is man-made, man you in trouble. Because man, I, I mean, do we have to repeat this? Man and man's own ingenuity, good, bad, or indifferent, man's own genius 
has never been able to figure out how to forgive man's sins and take us to eternal to a place called heaven forever and ever. Only God can do that. So this this last part, this business of hope, is is that to me it I mean it absolutely wraps up the beautiful picture of the Christmas story. There's hope in this Christ child. Hope. Jesus spoke about this hope, John chapter 14, verse 3. Let's, go, let's look at that right quick. John chapter 14, verse 3. We read verse 6 a while ago. Let's go read verse 3. John 14 and verse 3. Uh, well, let's, I'll just read verses 1 through 3. He said, Jesus is speaking now. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There's, there's, there's Jesus' invitation to you right there. Okay, you believe, you say, I believe in God. Jesus said, believe in me. Believe in what I am, who I am and what I've done. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You. Man. I hope there's not a big yard to mow. Anyway, verse 3. And if I go, Jesus is talking, if I go and prepare a place for you, your name is on it, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I'm telling you what, no matter how you cut, how you cut it, that's hope. That's the hope I have in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going there. Wherever there is with Jesus Christ, wherever Jesus is, that's where I'm going. And whatever Jesus has prepared for me, that's what I'm going to have. That is hope. Jesus spoke of this hope here in John 14, 3. By faith... One writer says, we believe what he said and our belief in him leads us to the hope that we will one day be with our Lord and Savior forever, ever. We do not hope in hope, but we hope in him. We do not hope in hope, but we hope in him. Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says, Jesus was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means there's others who are coming behind. This forms a foundation for our faith. This foundation is fortified by the promise of Jesus himself where he states in John 14, verse 19. John 14, verse 19, Jesus says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you shall see me because I live. You shall live also. Let me read that again. I'm in John chapter 14, verse 19. Yet a little while... The world seeth me more. He's talking about he was fixing to send back to the Father. The world seeth me no more. But you see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Mercy. Mm. Now there's hope right there. Got questions again. It states this. Faith and hope are complementary. Faith is grounded in the reality of the past. Hope is looking to the reality of the future. Without faith, there is no hope. And without hope, there is no true faith. Christians are people of faith and hope. We have the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. There is, there is an old song in, in reference to this hope uh, in our Christmas story. Uh, I, I just... I, <laughs> you ever get a song that just keeps kind of... Going and on, I, I just can remember, uh, when I was growing up, I stood here, my mother stood here, and, and that's just the way it was, and, I, and from time to time, I can still hear her singing, I hear her singing this hope. It's entitled, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now, I, listen, you won't find uh, my new album on iTunes yet, it's coming, but, but okay, all right, listen to, listen to the rest of this, the words of this song. It says, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale, and do they come? Yes, they do. My anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Our hope, 
is in Him, Jesus Christ. When he, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Right now, you are either standing on the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. This Christmas story is not just something you've read about, heard, or watched. You have personally experienced the Christmas story of love, sacrifice, faith, and hope. Or you haven't. I hope and pray today. That you'll simply, wherever you are, you'll simply bow your head and your heart and, and receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. The book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 13, there's one little verse there that says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, brother, I don't know all the words. I don't know how to pray. Okay, that's fine. Just call upon the Lord. Lord God, I need you in my life. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please save me. I, please, Lord God, come into my life. The words are not magical. It's the intent of the heart. I hope and pray that this Christmas, on this Christmas, the Christmas story, the story above all other stories, becomes your personal story so that you can not only read it, not only share it, but live it. The world needs to hear this Christmas story. Glad you've joined us today. Merry Christmas. Now, as we uh, conclude our time together uh, today, I, I, I want to just uh, visit with you. Uh, I know I can't sit in your, in your uh, living room at your kitchen table and talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, but that's really what I'd like to do. I, I'd like to share with you what we, we believe, what I believe is the most important message you'll ever hear. It, it's, it's certainly the most important message that we uh, have here at Mountain Valley Fellowship, and, and that message is this. God loves you. The Bible says in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. You put your name in. God loves you. You may not know that, understand that, believe that, accept, but I'm just telling you, based upon the Word of God, God wants you to know that today. He wants you to know He loves you. And He wants to know that if you believe in Him, not with just your head, but with your heart, you, if you'll trust Him and commit your life to Him, he will come into your life and you'll become a brand new person forever. You see, the great thing about God and, and, and His message for you is that um, it's, it's not just preacher talk. You know, us preachers are good at, you know, God, God backed His statement up. God said He loved you and, he, and then He proved it. He, he sent His Son, His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, one day stepped out of heaven onto the earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. Just think about that. Not one sin. A sinless life. One afternoon, willingly, sacrificially uh, offered himself uh, a, a, as the payment, the punishment. He took your payment, your punishment, my punishment, my payment. And he died on a cross for us. The, the scripture says this, uh, Romans 5, 8. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mercy. Now, the, the great news is that... Uh, not only did Jesus, God's one and only Son, come to the earth and live and die, the Bible tells us clearly that, he, that on the third day He rose from the grave. See, that's what separates Jesus from anyone else, everyone else, of all the pseudo-saviors that we've been introduced to in our world. There's only one of them, only one Savior who arose from the dead, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave, to offer us, to offer us new life, new life. Well, well okay, so why, why, why do I need new life? Well, the, again, the Bible's clear. It says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Way back there in the Garden of Eden, that perfect place, God had a perfect relationship with a perfect man and a woman, and one day, unfortunately, they chose to rebel against God's goodness, God's perfection, and sin. And that, as a result, the Bible tells us that that one man, sin passed upon generation after generation after generation. And the tragedy of sin is this. 
The wages of sin is death. There's a payment. There has to be a payment for your sin and my sin. Um, that means because of sin existing in our life, we're going to die physically. We'll, we'll, we'll experience a no death spiritually. And, and unfortunately, we'll know death eternally. But, but, but again, so, so what do we do? Well, what do you do? Well, again, my message for you is, gosh, this is so important. Right now, where you are, wherever you are, right now you can understand that God loves you, Christ died for you, and that if you'll receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior, you, you'll never be the same again. It says in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, Who shall, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no magical words. There's no magical place. John 1, uh, 12 and 13, But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. It's real simple. If you, if you believe and receive, then according to the truth of God, you will become a child of God. Let me ask you a question. We're, we're almost through. Uh, you know, I, this is just as personal as it gets, okay? Have you ever in your life has there ever been a moment, a, a place, a time where, where you just, just you now, bowed your head in your heart and said, Lord God, please come into my life and change me. You see, today I'm not, I'm not talking to you about religion. I'm not talking about you if you were raised in this church or that church, if you're a good person or a bad person. Do you pray? I, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Has there ever been that time when you said, Lord God, please come into my life and, 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 and change me? If not, why not? Why, why couldn't you today say, Lord God, right where you are, please come into my life and make, make an eternal difference. That's my prayer for you today. And, uh, you know, if I was sitting there in, in your living room and I'd, I'd just look you in the eye and tell you, hey, listen, not only God loves you, I love you. And uh, I, I, we just pray all the time that there comes a time, a time, a specific time, where you understand that God's personally reaching out to touch your life, to change your life, and he, and he wants to do that. Now, the great th thing about knowing God personally is that He wants you to know that you know Christ. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written that you might know that you have eternal life. You can know it. You know, some people say, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not sure. I, I think I'm saying, I think I... Listen to me. Don't don't, please don't base your eternity, your forever and ever and ever and ever on a hope so, a think so, or a maybe so. You can know so. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, any man, any woman can be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Today, the message is simple. God loves you. And all things in your life can become new. Listen to me. Right where you are, I just want to encourage you. You may be by yourself. You may be in a room full of people. Right where you are, just bow your head and your heart. Say, dear Lord God, you said if I called, you'd answer. Just say, Lord, please come into my life. The words are not magical. And, and I guarantee you, based upon the Word of God, this book, God will do exactly what He promised He will do you'll not only just know that God loves you, you'll also know the love of God. Now, uh, we just like to know. We'd like to know if, if, if today, for the very first time, and it only needs to happen once because when you receive Christ, He comes to your life, He never leaves you. If you received Christ today, you've prayed and, and, and accepted His free gift of eternal life. We'd like to know it. Uh, jot us a note, uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, mail, uh, post Office Box 420022, Hagen, Montana, 59842. Or, or, or shoot us an, an email message, uh, mtvalleyfellowship at gmail.com. And uh, we'd like to send you maybe some, some follow-up materials to help you grow in Christ. we just like to rejoice with you. Listen to me. A lot of people talking about a lot of things, a lot of opinions. I believe this, I believe that. A lot of isms, a lot of churches, a lot of religions. But I'm telling you, based upon this Bible, Based upon this word, God's saying to you, I love you.
Let us know what happens in your life, all right? And in the meantime, uh, you pray for me and I'll pray for you. God bless.